first port of call in Afghanistan is Herat. Afghani boots and sandals can be made to measure by the local craftsmen. The Afghani people are a very proud and dignified race and make interesting character studies for the photogenically minded. The country's history dates back to before the time of Alexander the Great and in later centuries came under the role of the legendary Genghis Khan. The Mongol traits in the people are easily discerned today. See the women with their veils completely covering their faces. These are called shaderies. Women rarely appear in public and when they do, they are always completely covered like this. The country is extremely poor and underdeveloped where the average annual per capita income only reaches $80 and the average life expectancy 40 years. In fact, only 5% of the population can read or write. It's by far the most backward country in Asia. Never having been colonized, Western civilization has completely passed this country by. For the boys at home with their hotted up cars, there's a lot they can learn here on how to decorate their pride and joy. The local form of transport is the Tonga, with gaily decorated horses drawing them. Although they traditionally dress in whites and browns, the objects around them abound in colour. And this is your local dry cleaners. Our girls keep your lacy negligees out of sight. Their specialties are limited. The silverware is beautifully handcrafted and all at reasonable prices. And you must try some of the local bread, quite safe to eat and well worth the effort. You couldn't call these five-star restaurants, but they're very popular with the locals and the kebabs are good snacks between meals. drink. Just outside Kandahar, the ruins of a caravanserai remind the traveller of bygone days, when these square mud-walled sanctuaries were used as refuges for passing traders. James A. Michener's book Caravans discusses them in detail and serves as good introductory reading for Afghanistan. altitude of 6,000 feet, the capital, Kabul, is set at the base of the beautiful Hindu Kush mountains. The city is an incredible mosaic of grey, brown mud houses. A communist-inspired coup in April 1978 brought a Marxist government to power, but somehow the country's new red flag is incongruous in an atmosphere heavy with centuries of Islam. The Kobol River meanders through the heart of the city with two craggy ranges on either side, where we find the local women busy with their daily washing. Hey, cut it out. Can't you see I'm trying to get my horns on television? Meh. <laughs> These are the famous Tatar trucks, a standard yet highly decorated form of transportation carrying everything from garbage to furniture and even people.
just outside Cobble is Asia's oldest animal market. For those brave enough to bear the early morning temperatures, a whole range of camels, goats, donkeys and buffaloes can be seen. Prospective buyers are reminded that there's no room on the bus though. This particular morning, the main produce on sale was water buffalo. Here we see the cattle yards where the local cattlemen sort their animals out for prospective buyers. And of course the scene wouldn't be right without the local chai man. To many people, Afghanistan typifies the real overland. That is, being able to view people in their natural habitat. This market in Kabul offers a kaleidoscope of different colours, sounds and sights. The intrusion of thousands of Russian advisers has enraged the fiercely independent Afghani people and rebel Muslims have voiced their disapproval with several uprisings. Afghani coats, jumpers, socks and belts can all be purchased from the traders, especially round Chicken Street. Bidding farewell to Kabul and Afghanistan, it's back on the reliable Bristol double-decker heading east down the breathtaking Kabul Gorge and on to Pakistan. Pakistan, we drive over history's most famous pass, the Khyber. Your mind drifts back in history to the times of the Persians, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and more recently, the British, who all fought battles to control the strategic point. This rugged mountain area is inhabited by the equally inhospitable Pushtun tribesmen and we are only allowed to cross the pass in daylight hours. taken beside the entrance to the Khyber Rifles Regiment is a must for most of the passengers. The Khyber Rifles Fort was built by the British last century during the Anglo-Afghan Wars and has since passed on to the Pakistanis. We found the renowned Khyber Rifle soldiers a little more friendly than expected. was actually to celebrate a forthcoming marriage for one of the soldiers and the dance imitates the wedding ceremony. This is the bride. Beautiful, isn't she? 
Soon we'll be continuing our journey across the plains of Pakistan and eventually into India, through Rawalpindi, Peshawar and Lahore, then to our first port of call in India. Amritsar is in the Punjab region of India and is the holy city of the Sikh religion. The magnificent Golden Temple is most sacred to the Sikhs and is a superb shrine of intricately carved marble and gold leaf, glittering in an expanse of water. We have now entered the third major cultural change of our trip, the steaming masses of India the ever-strong Hindu faith with all its different sects. After Kabul, we travelled over the Khyber Pass and into Pakistan, through Rawalpindi and Lahore, and on to our first stop in India, Amritsar. We now move north to Jammu in the state of Kashmir, where we leave the double-decker and board local transport for the journey to Srinagar in the Happy Valley. Kashmir is perhaps the most scenic spot in India. The majority of the population are Muslim, and this has led to many religious conflicts and disturbances with its Hindu rulers. As a result, about one-third of India's army is stationed in Kashmir. Looking down on the beautiful Kashmir Valley is a memorable experience with the matchbox-like villages in perfect harmony with the surroundings. The valley settles at an altitude of 5,000 feet. It's now autumn, but during the summer, green growth is abundant across the valley, reminiscent of some areas of England, which is probably why the British decided on this valley for their holiday retreat. Srinagar, the capital, we stay in Victorian houseboats on Lake Dal, where top deck pay the basic costs. Once the dream gardens of the Mughal emperors, Srinagar became a popular resort area in British colonial times last century, and the interiors of the boats still retain that unmistakable British influence. Truly a paradise, where our four days here are a welcome break to enjoy the luxury and pleasures of days gone by and to investigate in more detail the history and development of one of the oldest holiday resorts in the world. There are various activities you can involve yourself in from snow skiing, horse riding, boating or just mingling with the local people, enjoying the wares and pleasures they've perfected over centuries of catering for the desires of foreign visitors. The hand-woven Kashmiri carpets are world famous with wide selections available, while paper mache products and intricate wood carvings are other local industries. This craftsman has been working on this piece for nearly a year. Goods are ferried across the lake on these sharas or canoes, and traders come right up to your floating verandas to negotiate business. It's certainly a very relaxed and interesting lifestyle. Servants are even provided in the houseboats to look after your every whim and desire. An interesting concept, I must admit. At the snap of fingers, the shop comes to you, not you go to the shop. That's what I call style. An authentic Kashmiri banquet and dancing evening can be arranged by the courier. The meal usually consists of some form of curried meat and rice.
not in the same class as Barbara Streisand, but quite entertaining just the same. As our time in Srinagar comes to an end, we say goodbye to our house servant and commence the journey back to the bus. Truly one of the highlights of our trip, and one you shall never forget. Shopping for fresh fruit and vegetables is an ongoing function throughout the duration of the trip. The cooks obtain food kitty money from the courier and usually buy enough food for two to three days at a time. Sign language is usually the common form of communication with the local shopkeepers to establish prices and quantities. New Delhi, the capital of the largest democracy in the world. India has a population of 630 million, a majority of them Hindus, speaking a language of over 850 dialects. The spacious design of New Delhi laid out by the British in the 1920s contrasts greatly to the streets and slums in the old part of the city. Standing here in Connaught Square, it's difficult to relate this scene to the countless millions of Indians which we so readily identify with, yet just half a mile from here, those impressions will be more than fulfilled. Driving on Indian roads can be a harrowing experience at the best of times. Just ask your top deck driver. Nevertheless, you'll have more than enough time to indulge and add yet another story to the countless millions already told by those who have passed through here in recent years. Another legacy of British colonial days is the gentleman's game of cricket. When they left the Indian subcontinent in 1947, the game stayed behind. The backdrop here is Delhi's famous red fort, built in 1639 from thick red sandstone and the former home of the peacock throne. At night you can see the sound and light show here, depicting the intriguing history of this fort. After a day's sightseeing, the campsite bar proves a popular meeting place where we gather and exchange stories and talk of things to come or just relax and enjoy the local brews. Our campsite in Delhi lies on the border between Old and New Delhi and provides first-class facilities with hot showers, washrooms, restaurant and bars, a welcome chance to catch up on all those domestic chores that have got left behind. As you can imagine, orange and white double-deckers are really fair sights in Indian country towns and usually attract a fair bit of attention. further south now towards Agra. Early morning starts overcome normal congestions on the roads while during the day playing cards is another advantage of this self-contained style of travel. About 200 kilometers northeast of Delhi and just outside Agra is Akbar's tomb. The burial place of the former Mughal emperor is set in a 150-acre animal sanctuary. In the distance here, we capture our first glimpse of India's famous Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal was built by Emperor Shah Jahan in the early 17th century as a mausoleum for Queen Mumtaz Mahal, who died giving birth to her 14th child. Viewed from such close quarters, it becomes a sight greater than your expectations. Travelling towards Varanasi on the Ganges Plain is some of the most densely populated areas of the country. Roads are cluttered with all types of vehicles from rickshaw, ox cart, donkeys and bicycles and of course masses of people. In 
in Varanasi, or Benares, as it used to be called, the Hindus can be seen praying at their houses of worship. The smell of burning oil and incense pervades continuously throughout the temples. The architecture and design of these temples is an interest all of its own. The intricate craftsmanship involved and the glow of the red sandstock blocks so popular in this area on buildings of such majestic importance. Life wasn't meant to be easy, but the sacred cows know that's not true. Most are in lot better condition than the people. A of rupees, the snake charmers can turn on a convincing show for the interested tourists. adventurous onlooker can become more actively involved in the proceedings while a rather reluctant mongoose brought down the final curtain on the act. An early morning boat ride down the holy Ganges River is an unforgettable experience. For thousands of years, Hindu pilgrims have come here to cleanse themselves of their sins in the sacred water of the Ganges. Every Hindu wishes to be cremated here and the funeral pyres can be seen on the water's edge. The remains of the bodies are thrown in the river. Prayer, meditation and the cleansing rites are conducted along the waterfront. And of course the sacred cow, most fortunate of all Indian animals. It may not have any sins to cleanse, but a bit of a cool off in the water from the hot Indian sun is more to their liking. Crossing the long pontoon bridge, we now enter Kajareo, the last of our major ports of call in India, before heading north into the Himalayas and the Nepalese border. A now relatively deserted Indian city where we visit the temples famous for their erotic carvings and sample the last of true Indian curries. British colonial influence still stands strong in some parts of the city. We are now crossing into Nepal and our journey is drawing to an end. Passports are collected for the last time, so visa information can be checked by the Nepalese officials. Border crossings involve a lot of red tape and can be very time consuming. Passengers are expected to take this in the right spirit. Anyway, soon we're off on the road again. The Nepalese countryside contrasts greatly to that of India and noticeably more Chinese influence in the people themselves. Approaching Pakara, we decided safer to use the river crossing than this bridge, which wasn't really designed for heavy double-decker buses, and the powerful Bristol has no trouble in forging through the water, up and out the other side. Here we have our last rendezvous with the other bus before moving on to Kathmandu. The setting here at Pakara is magnificent for just such an occasion, lying at the foothills of the majestic snow-capped Himalayas. 
lush green vegetation are familiar sights as we climb into the Kathmandu Valley with that ever-present white skyline in the background. Kathmandu is the capital of the Kingdom of Nepal and has been likened to the Florence of Asia. Durba Square is the centre of downtown Kathmandu beside the old royal palace and close to the cheap hotels and ethnic markets. Flourishing of art and architecture is amply demonstrated in the temples and shrines in a land where Hinduism and Buddhism peacefully coexist. Buddhist temples are usually in the pagoda style with central stupas and countless prayer wheels. This is actually the monkey temple in Kathmandu. It is claimed by the Nepalese that Buddha was born in southern Nepal around 560 BC. It is also here that our trip terminates, 18,000 kilometers and 10 weeks after the Dover to Calais crossing on our first day out of London. So that's our Asian overlander, an unforgettable experience through the world's most unforgettable countries. Our itinerary takes you to cities and famous sites as well as off the beaten track. The travelling hotel is the most comfortable and practical vehicle on what could otherwise be a long and arduous journey. And only on top deck will you travel with people of your own age and background. I guess that's it. Kathmandu. Oh, I won't forget this place. The management and staff of Top Tech Travel would like to thank you very, very much for viewing this film. For further information on our overland tours, contact Top Deck or your nearest travel agent. Thank you very, very much indeed.